Well, thank you very much to the panelists. Uh, now let's uh, entertain questions if there are any from the audience. I believe that there are some microphones uh, and when someone finds you with a microphone, please um, say who you are and ask a question. Uh, and please try to keep questions or comments relatively brief so we can have a chance to hear from several different people. So now. Uh, there's someone here uh, wearing a white top in the black who has the microphone. We'll start there. Hi, my name is Aisha Dubo. I'm a student from the Boston Student Advisory Council and Youth on Board. My question is, how do you guys plan on making students aware of this big change? Because I think at the end of the day that the students are the ones that are affected the most by this change and the students are the ones that are taking this test and you can't just throw things at them and expect them to kind of just go along with it. As I know that the teachers also have a big role in this, but I think that is very important that the students are aware of this change so that they can know what they're going up against. Absolutely. Um, thank you for bringing up our wonderful students because in the end, it's all about them, their achievement, their lives. And I think this is where the buy-in from the superintendent's level all the way down is so important because it shouldn't be a shock when the student goes in to take the MCAS or the interim as we move to the new assessment. It should never be a surprise what's on the test. That's where the teacher in the classroom is so critical because it's the teacher in the classroom who is going to be the mediator, so to speak, between the, the student and the test. And that's why the, the educator in the classroom has to be on board. There should be, it, the standards should be posted Students should know, oh, Learning Standard 13. I know what Learning Standard 13 is. That's non-fictional text, and I know exactly what a common, um, a common test item would look like. So it's really, it's, it's the teacher, but the teacher can't do it without the administrator's support. And so the p support has to go not only from student and teacher, but also all the way up. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, next question, Isa. Uh, hi, I'm Andy Churchill Sorry. from the UMass Amherst Center for Education Policy. Um, I'm wondering if you can give us a sense um, what exactly the per in, a, in a sort of percentage format of what the overlap is between our current standards and the Common Core, and you know, are we talking about you know a 10 percent difference, a 25 percent difference, and you know, is it new things being added or old things being dropped? And then secondly, are the textbook companies involved in, in this effort as well? I can start. Uh, I can speak a little bit about the math. Um, I'd say there's almost a 90% overlap. In order to adopt the Common Core, we had to, as a state, agree to um, use, the, use the whole Common Core and, and maintain its integrity, and we could add up to 15% additional curriculum in each content area. So for the state of Massachusetts, obviously the pre-K standards um, are, are separate from that because they're not included in the K through 12 curriculum. But I know that for math, I want to say that we added 10 standards in all of K to 8 and an additional um, 8 standards or 9 standards maybe in the high school, uh, 9 through 12 curricula. Um, so it's really minimal. And I, I would say that the changes were to bring to the Common Core pieces that we had in our former framework that made it more cohesive and um, ensured that the level of expectation was the same as it was in the past. I don't know if anybody has more information on the English. So I, I would agree that the, the what's in common is greater than what's not in common. Where there are differences may be in some um, placement and grade specific um, so some things that maybe we had in our, our uh, previous framework had in fourth grade, maybe in fifth grade, as Jeff said, or something that was in sixth grade may now be in fourth grade. So the, the content specific um, is there's a good correlation there of, 
of consistency. It's, it's primarily the location. I think for the English language arts uh, framework, the, the um, piece that is much more robust in the new document is the writing. Um, is much uh, more explicit, and the writing uh, in conjunction with reading. Um, as, as Jeff mentioned before, we've asked students um, to write about, you know, um, tell us about what you did on a snow day. Um, I think, David, that created some havoc one year because we hadn't had a snow day. Um, so uh, this year that would not be a problem. But uh, um, so, so going forward, what we're going to be asking students to do is to read um, maybe two or three pieces of, um, of, of a, a nonfiction, a fiction, and, and make some comparisons, some contrast. Uh, how would they analyze? So the writing is going to be connected to reading, and that's different. But it's still, um, it's, it's still writing, which we had in our old framework. Um, but the, the explicit nature of it is what's different in, the, in these new documents. And I'll, ju I'll just add, Julia brought up a good point about the majority of the changes being what's instructed at which grade level. The same is true in math, with uh, a couple of exceptions. Uh, in, in math, we had, um, for whatever reason, we had a lot of topics that were instructed repeatedly from, say, uh, later elementary school, maybe fourth grade, straight through middle school. And a lot of that was, you know, the probability, the basic statistics, mean, median, mode. And as a former math director, I know that I, I would go into a fourth grade classroom and I would see a teacher instructing about mode, for example, being the most common element in a data set. And then I'd go to the fifth grade and I'd see a teacher instructing about mode being the most common element in a data set. And I'd go to the sixth grade and the seventh grade and the eighth grade. And I wanted to pull my own hair out. I can't imagine what the kids felt like. The Common Core has uh, remediated some of those issues where topics are expected for mastery at a particular grade level and they're not just continuously repeated, repeated, repeated. And another major change, shift in content is that at the gr eighth grade level, there's a much greater emphasis on linearity and knowledge of functions, which often was, so, well, was sometimes left to the high school, sometimes done in eighth grade. It was really kind of um, hit or miss depending on what district you were in or what school you were in. So there's more specificity there where the students will leave eighth grade with a more solid understanding of linear, linearity and functions and then be better prepared for uh, an authentic algebra course in ninth grade. So I also want to point out that the side-by-side -side comparison is on the MBAE website with the West Ed analysis. Uh, so you have a chance to look for yourself to answer specific qu questions about specific content strands or grade levels. The second part of your question about whether publishers were involved, uh, I'm not sure I completely understood whether you meant in the development of the standards or will they be in, involved in some way in developing a uh, curriculum moving forward. Uh, so, and, and that may or may not be uh, the most salient feature, but um, I think everyone will end up having some role or responsibility in thinking about what happens as we move ahead uh, and think about curriculum that is aligned to what the standards are. Um, so, and now that they are common across multiple states, uh, I think the publishers are more likely to be responsive more quickly than when only California or Texas made changes to their standards. Uh, hi. Now, I don't know. Okay. Hi. I can't see where the microphone ends up, but. <laughs> I'm Eileen Lee, and I work in math education, and I have a question for Diane Kelly. It was great to hear the work that's already going on in Revere with the faculty discussions and the planning for next year's professional development. In the math side, I'm curious how you're integrating the standards for mathematical practice into the, these discussions and plans for PD. Um, it's so important and many of us are afraid it's gonna get a little lost or back burnered. It's, it's definitely very important, you're right, and it's definitely a challenge. We've been, uh, in Revere, we've been working for several years on um, standards-based instruction and changing some of the norms of how teachers teach, emphasi emphasizing more uh, differentiated instruction, that stuff in the classroom. 
So because of that, our teachers really do have a foundational understanding of uh, many of the standards for mathematical practice and what tasks they can engage students in in order to evidence those different practices. So that's really where our conversation is. And as I said, I think that we're lucky. I know that some other districts haven't really had that emphasis already. Um, but it's definitely work. And it's work talking to teachers and having them share their ideas about, you know, well, I don't really, I don't really know what this mathematical practice, how, how I'm going to ev evidence that in relation to this particular topic. And then as Greg said, just having those conversations, teachers say, well, you could do that this way. And they come up with ideas and they come up with, um, you know, different prompts and different tasks for the students to, to complete that will enable them to evidence the different standards of mathematical practice. One of them is asking them to write and to speak about math and about the processes they use in solving problems. So that covers a lot of the different critical areas in the, in the standards of mathematical practice. But those are things that some teachers are not used to asking their kids to do during a mathematics lesson. So is that helpful? Thank you. Lisa. So the answers to the question prior about the percentage of overlap resulted in a very positive message, both because it means what we were doing before was good and what we're planning to go forward with is an improvement, which actually is, brings me to my original question. Greg mentioned that there's a little bit of a flap in his area of Massachusetts that uh, is being led by one of the legislators. So when the question was asked about who needs to be informed and the young woman answered students, I think we should also think if it is ethical about legislators because they do have a lot of influence and in addition to their appropriate influence, get, getting into a conversation about why this is good or bad or what we should do or shouldn't do or why we should uh, try to, uh, to um, eliminate these new standards is a waste of our precious energy which should be placed in working with teachers and principals and superintendents. So, question, it does, is it appropriate for the department to reach out? So, second, and the answer for those who can't hear, Jeff said yes. The, the second <laughs> part is, are we doing it? So Jeff's answer was, we probably could do more of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nancy Spitulnik. I'm assistant superintendent in the Northbridge Schools. And I have a suggestion and then a question. Um, I'm part of a group of curriculum directors in the Blackstone Valley. We meet monthly to share and collaborate on curriculum, on professional development. And we have now added Common Core as a monthly agenda item for us to share information and start talking about how we are going to be working in our districts to implement Common Core. And a suggestion for the state might be to pull together groups of people from each district who are really responsible for implementing Common Core in their districts to support those people because I think they're going to be critical in all the districts, especially in some of the smaller districts where we wear so many hats. Um, and I think that would be very helpful to all of us and really move the implementation forward. And um, my question is, we know that the content of the MCAS is going to change. And what we hear from teachers a lot is, is the format of the MCAS going to change in terms of the multiple choice and the open response and short answer? Because um, we've really spent so much time really helping students be ready to answer what's on the MCAS. And even if the content is changing, um, will the format also change? I think Jeff is well poised to answer that question. <laughs> I think you might have to flick a switch. It should be on. Testing, is yeah, it on? It's on, it's on. Okay. So, uh, not to give a long explanation, the MCAS will, the format of MCAS will remain the same, you know, through 2014. So there will be the multiple choice and the open response as you've come to know and love. Okay. Uh, but uh, PARC will be quite different. Car uh, it will be different in that um, there will be through course assessments, meaning there will be testing not just at the end of the year in the spring, but there will be short tests after 25, 50, and 75% of the school year. 
and most of those tests will focus on uh, performance tasks, if you will. That's when the writing assignments will be emphasized. That's when the open response questions and mathematics will be emphasized. The end of year test, at least as the way it's designed currently, and this can evolve. Uh, it's just a sort of a blueprint right now, and a lot of it will need to be field tested, but the end of year component will be more of a machine scorable type of component because the goal is to roll up the results from each of those through course assessments with the end of year assessment to give an overall score that will re be reported back before the end of the school year. Okay, so that, I'll leave it at that and I'm sure there'll be a lot more sessions on what that future assessment will look like and uh, as, you know, over, probably beginning the spring or next year, certainly. And I just want to add that uh, as part of the professional development that we're planning for um, the state, um, we're hoping that in June, depending on when most school districts uh, are able to, um, to attend, that we will be pulling together curriculum directors, assistant superintendents responsible for curriculum to do exactly what you've talked about, to talk about what's up to, and to develop a plan. So to pull uh, folks that are doing similar kinds of work together so that they can say, here's what we were thinking, here's what we were thinking, um, here's our timeline, and then to identify places where we can collaborate and share resources, <coughs> share speakers, um, share days. Um, so that is on our agenda to, to do this year before, the, before July hits and um, people are gone for the summer. Thank you. Penny. Uh, I'm still Penny Noyce, and I have a question uh, about uh, technology and about the curriculum units uh, that the department is thinking about developing. Uh, and that's something that we never did before. In fact, there was a big resistance to saying we endorse a particular curriculum. So my question is, will, is are these units things that the department is planning to develop de novo, or will there be uh, an attempt to look at existing textbooks, as Greg mentioned, and say, you know, if you can use these chapters and add a unit on such and such, you'll be in good shape. And related to that, is there any uh, interest in using open source CK12 and other things to make a uh, new curriculum available for free to districts? So um, I just want to, I think we're, um, well, I'm just going to give my definition of a curriculum. So a curriculum is the, the what that we teach. And um, there, we can use any number of resources to teach that what. So when, um, so I don't, this is my own personal view. Um, I don't view a, a textbook as a curriculum. Um, it has become the default curriculum, but ideally um, your curriculum um, is designed and then you identify the resources, the textbooks, the, the um, original artifacts, the um, different kinds of resources to teach that. So, um, so in, in our idea about curriculum development, what we're looking at is developing a, a unit that would be somewhere for six to eight weeks. I'll use the ever popular fractions unit um, that, that Barbara and I have talked about so often. Um, we develop a, a unit around how would we teach the standards, how, what, what would that look like in a classroom um, for fourth grade if we were teaching fractions? What would that four to six weeks um, look like what would be the standards that we would be addressed, what would be the specific skills, um, the knowledge um, that we'd want students to be able to, to learn during that time, what would be the resources that we would um, imp use. Um, it could get to lesson plans. We don't intend to be quite that um, specific, but you know, how would you uh, make some modifications for your English language learners? How would you address the needs of students with special ed? So having that packaged, um, what are some curriculum embedded performance assessments that you could use along the way to, you know, to find out if students are actually um, learning this information. So that will be created as a model unit. Um, are we going to mandate that? No. Uh, it's there as a model. It's there as a resource that districts can use as a starting place to do exactly what Greg has talked about to take this and say, you know, the, a state working in collaboration with fourth grade teachers or elementary teachers around the state 
put together this model. Um, we think that for our particular students, we'd want to modify this. We, you know, we're using a different um, textbook materials, so we need to plug in our textbook materials when they fit here. Um, so, uh, using open. So the second part of your question is: there any intent to use uh, open source materials? Absolutely. That would be part of the resources that we would bring to bear um, in, as part of this. Um, teaching and learning system that we're creating as part of our Race to the Top application. Uh, I, there's a woman back there who, who has a microphone already. Good morning. My name is Ann Barish, and I'm the Director of History and Social Studies for the Randolph Public Schools. And I bet you can anticipate my question, <laughs> which, my, which is, and this is directed to Julia and Jeff, um, what role do you see for history and social studies in the Common Core, number one, and number two, what plans do you have for keeping history and social studies a vibrant and powerful um, academic uh, group in the same ways that English language, arts, science, and uh, mathematics is? Mm -hmm. And um, I have some suggestions, as you can well imagine, but I would <laughs> love to hear what you can do to keep us part of the conversation Absolutely. and vibrant and a contribution. Absolutely. So um, in the design of our uh, Race to the Top application, when we talked about developing model curriculum units, we did not just go with ELA and math. We said we were going to be um, designing model units for science, social studies, and history. So we will be working with teachers across the state in developing these models in all four core content areas. Um, so that's the first piece, is that we want social studies history teachers um, at the table with us. We want them working on developing these models that we can post to our website. Um, we also know that when you look at this, the standards, for um, literacy in social studies, literacy in science and the technical subjects, that that's a really wonderful place for us to integrate. And so we know that we need to, to make sure that we have conversations and that when we're creating these models that we identify ways for teachers to um, take those new standards that are attached to the ELA framework um, and make those a real part of the science framework and the, the social studies framework. So that's one way that we, um, we want to keep the um, spotlight, I'll use the word spotlight, on those other subjects. Um, I know that that's, a, that's an issue. Folks feel like, well, the only thing that we assess are ELA and math and a uh, little bit of science and the other things um, lose luster. So uh, in our curriculum development, um, that's part of our plan. I think um, I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Jeff, do you have anything else that you would like to add, or we're OK? OK, let's move on to another question over here. I have a question. I'm Beverly Nelson, Assistant Superintendent for the Metro Public Schools. I'm very optimistic about this whole process. I've been involved. I'm optimistic about the professional development getting done, the curriculum work getting done. I am not as optimistic about the resources and maybe getting back to what Penny said. We can barely in many school districts afford replacement texts. When I go before the school committee, the very least with the English, we need supplemental materials. Mathematics may call for whole new programs uh, that we, again, can't afford. We really need the district, you know, the race to the top money has money for professional development and for curriculum work but very little, if anything, for materials to support that. And that's what teachers need in classrooms. So I am asking the department, if you can, develop inexpensive resources. We can use technology to deliver these, because when I bring this back to the school committee, they're going to say, we have no money to do this. We want to do it. It's the right thing for kids. But how do we do it, given the fiscal situation? And that's what you're going to hear from superintendents, very loud and clear. Mm -hmm. So please keep that in mind, that that is a big piece to all of this. Many districts will get the money. The Bostons may get the money, but the Medfords won't. And again, this is where the equity issue, the Warrens won't get the money as well. 
And this is where the equity issue comes in. So that's a real important piece to making this successful. Your comments are well taken. We, we are all well aware of the fiscal constraints under which we operate. Uh, and perhaps some of the collaboration and convenings that are likely to occur uh, as this process uh, continues uh, to be implemented may yield some suggestions about collaboration and uh, sharing different kinds of resources. That, that's at least one thing to offer. curriculum units. Uh, I, think, well, I think Penny was hinting at the fact that we need to look at the resources that you have now. Mm -hmm. and, we, and as a state and with our committees of teachers that we're putting together, we need to identify the resources of the textbooks you're using now. How do they address the standards? And then where are the gaps? And be able to identify resources that you can use at low cost to fill those gaps. So I think that's an approach we can take as we do this development work. Because you don't want to start, uh, you know, just uh, you, you want to start with where you are now. So I think that will be one approach to try to address that particular issue. Thank you. I, I think that we're actually out of time. Um, but before we completely wrap up, um, I want to thank all of the participants, um, Jeff, Diane, Greg, Karen, Sean, and Julia, for sharing your insights. Thank you very much. And, and prompting us to engage in a lively, interesting, and hopefully ongoing conversation. Also, on behalf of MBAE, thank you, Penny, uh, and the Rennie Center for your partnership and the work that you have done till now and that you will continue to do. Uh, and I want to put in a plug for two upcoming uh, forums. April 12th is the first one, when we will focus on what's next for the Common Core. Uh, particularly in terms of assessments, and June 14th when we'll talk about how the Common Core is going to help us think about defining and operationalizing college and career readiness. And finally, uh, today's forum series has been made possible with generous support from uh, Fidelity Investments, our host for today, Intel, Nellie May, uh, and the Pearson Evaluation Systems based in Hadley, Mass. Um, if any of you would like to share the information about where you can find this online, this will be a valuable resource for those sleepless nights. Um, please send feedback, uh, and thank you again for coming out this morning. Thank you. Thank you.